they all died in faith, not having received the promise, but seeing it far off. For they declared plainly that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For if they had been mindful of the country from whence they came, they may have been permitted to return. But as it were, they sought a better country, a heavenly country, where God would not be ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Hello, and welcome to Simple Man Sermons, the preachings of a simple man called by God to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now who, who is the they? They all died in faith. The they are the patriarchs. They are the great men in the Bible that God used to tell his story, to bring about salvation to the world. Abraham, Moses, they all died in faith. Not having received the promise, but seeing it afar off. For they declared plainly that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And I think it's a good time to remind ourselves that we are all strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This earth is not our home. We are strangers here. We are pilgrims here. We are sojourning through a foreign land. But we were made for another place. We were made for something better. We were made to be in the presence of God. We are made in his very own image. And it's not his will that any of us should perish and go away from that. Now instead of paraphrasing... Reciting that from memory, let me read to you from Hebrews 11. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We here in America may have a skewed view of a pilgrim. We may see some Protestant reformist traveling to America with a black hat and a black buckle and wearing all black in the New England days of the 1600s. That's not what this is referring to, obviously. This was written long before then. And those are called pilgrims for a reason. And I looked up the number one definition of a pilgrim. I just looked it up, and the first one that popped up was Oxford Dictionary. Pilgrim, a person who journeys to a sacred place for religious reasons. Now, the pilgrims we think about got that name. They fled here to have religious freedom, to be able to worship, and not from the Catholic Church, but the way that they interpreted the Bible and thought to do what it said. And if you ever go listen to some of the old pilgrim sermons, which you can listen to for free, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but a lot of those are reread from what had been written down of what they preached, and they're great sermons. I actually think I have a playlist on YouTube entitled Great Sermons where they go back and reread not just the pilgrims, but a lot of those are good sermons. A pilgrim is somebody that's going somewhere for religious reasons. We are all strangers and pilgrims on the earth. There's a reason those great patriarchs were pilgrims. Moses, we think about him and his wandering. We think about his 40 years. Some people want to get technical, 38 But that was his second pilgrimage, his second, the Exodus was his second time. He spent 40 years prior to that in the wilderness, a pilgrim, a stranger, a pilgrim. We think of Abraham, Abraham, whom is like the patriarch of whom God called and chose his people and made him a people, made him a nation out of Abraham's loins. He was a stranger and a pilgrim. Kind of when we see him starting his story, he's called out of the land that he is from to go on a pilgrimage, to go somewhere that he wasn't from, a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. 
Likewise, Joseph, he wasn't from Egypt. He was called to go there. And likewise, Moses, he was called to flee from there. The great men in the Bible, David too, had to flee many times, many different places. They all declared plainly that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now this is an example for us. We are all strangers or pilgrims on the earth. No matter if you travel around all the time or if you've lived in one town your whole life, if you are a child of God, if you are called, brothers and sisters, to be children of God, then you are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. To demonstrate this, I'll go to another passage that refers to pilgrims. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You are a stranger, you are a pilgrim. Who is your example? Are we not to do just as he did? Are we not to walk as he walked? Jesus, Jesus Christ. He is our example. Was he not a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth? Was he not called to travel all around and preach the good news? And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus Christ, the King of King and Lord of Lords, Alpha and Omega, the Great I Am, the Son of God. He is different. He is different from any other king. Kings generally live in palaces. People come from all over to see the king. People travel from far distant countries to see the king. And he's usually, again, stationed in a great palace. But not our king, not our Lord. He traveled around. He traveled around Galilee. He often went into the wilderness. He traveled to call the lost sheep. Was he not on a pilgrimage to do the will of his Father in heaven? Unlike any other king. He says, I gave you an example that you should follow. He says this when he washes his disciples' feet. He says to his disciples, if you want to be great, you have to be like him who serves. He is different. Can you think of any other pilgrim kings? King of kings and Lord of lords. He didn't build for himself on his time here on earth. He didn't build for himself a great palace with shiny floors and and rich gold decorations and have everybody come to him. No, he sought them out. He sought the lost sheep, the good shepherd. He wandered about and found the lost sheep. By earthly standards, poor. He didn't live in a giant mansion. He wandered around. What most would consider today a vagrant and a homeless person. That's my king because he cared more about his lost sheep than the things of this world, than wealth. Do you not remember when Satan brought him up to the pinnacle and said, All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship him. And Jesus said, No, he refused. He said, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He wasn't here to get rich. He wasn't here to get wealth, to get to get earthly possessions. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and without Him was not anything made that was made. It all belonged to Him anyway. Well, by earthly standards, He didn't need to wall Himself up in some shiny castle. He Himself was the light of the world. The world was made through Him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. 
And without him was not anything made that was made. The word. The most powerful man that ever lived. The most influential man that ever lived. Even if you don't believe. Even if you are a staunch atheist. You can't deny that Jesus changed the world more than any man who ever lived. And by earthly standards, poor. By what culture would say today, poor. But the most most influential man that ever lived, the most powerful man that ever lived, the man who changed the world more than any other that was ever born. And he himself says, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Are we not called to be like him? Are we not called to live like him? If you cannot hear those birds in the background, I am in a little cove in the forest, in the shade. God provides. I couldn't think of a better place to preach this sermon. What got me thinking about this sermon is my wife and I have been on a pilgrimage for the last while. We have been traveling. And I, by God's grace, have been traveling since I joined the Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps at 17. Right after I graduated, I shipped off. And I've pretty much been moving around the country and around the world since then. Some 20 years. 20 years almost. Maybe more. But let's say, give or take 20 years. A stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. Now I was a stranger before that, and I'll be a stranger after this. But I'm glad I'm glad that God called me the path that I've walked. I'm glad to be a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. I'm glad to not know where I'll lay my head next week. Because it's a reminder to not get too comfortable in this world. I've lived many places. I've been blessed to see many sunsets in many different places. I've seen the sunset over the battlefields of Iraq. I've seen the sunset on the Atlantic and the sunset on the Pacific. I've seen the sunset in the mountains, many mountain ranges. I've been blessed to see all that, but none of that is my home. I have places that I dearly love. I have places that I'll, by God's grace, remember until the day that I die, their natural beauty. I've eaten many of my fine meals, by God's grace. But this world is not my home. And me staying on the move, being mobile, being a literal pilgrim, reminds me. And by God's grace, gives me the ability to preach to you that we are all strangers and pilgrims on this earth. So don't get too comfortable. Don't get lackadaisical. Whatever nice house God has blessed you with. And as the Bible says, what do you have that you did not first receive? You wouldn't have it if God didn't allow you to have it. All authority is granted from above. Anything you may temporarily hold on to in this world, like trying to hold on to sand in a waterfall, whatever you may be trying to hold on to in this world, don't ever forget that it's passing away. This world is passing away. The things which you see are temporary, the Bible says. The things which are not seen are eternal. You can't see love. Like the breeze, like the wind that I'm watching right now in the grass, you can see the effects of love, but you can't tangibly see love. And God is love. The things that are eternal, the things that don't change, you don't see. The opposite of what the world will tell you. They'll tell you if you can see it and experience it and touch it, it's real. But what's more real is the things that you can't see. God is love, the Bible says. God does not change. No matter how big a mountain you see or a stone you see, one day it will not be that way. It is changing. It is passing away. But God is never passing away. He is eternal. Love is eternal. The things that you can't see last forever. The things you see on this earth are temporary. So don't get too attached to them. You are a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. You are called brothers and sisters a holy nation, a royal priesthood, his own special people. You're a pilgrim. So remember that you're a pilgrim. Does the Bible not say if you're a friend of this world, you're at enmity with God? What does it say in James? 
James 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of this world becomes an enemy of God. You are chosen people. That's what holy means, set apart. Be separate from the world. When everybody else is getting so attached and things and valuing their life on how much stuff they have. Does it matter how big a house you die in? Does that really matter? Or does it matter where you go when you die? Your permanent home. No matter how big your house is on this earth, no matter how big a mansion you die in, you don't get to take it with you. So remember what's important. Remember what's eternal. Do you remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? Who lived on the street and a rich man dined sumptuously. But when he died, Lazarus went to heaven and the rich man went to hell. And the rich man just wanted Lazarus to dip his finger in water so that he could have some temporary relief from his eternal hell. Likewise you, it's better to die homeless on the street and be right with God and be his chosen people and go to heaven than to die in a mansion and go to hell. What are those short, short years? What does it say in Ecclesiastes? Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. How does a rich man die like a poor man? That's not what's going to matter. As it's written, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Jesus Christ is Lord. Is he your Lord now? Because he rules a heavenly kingdom. He is seated at the right hand of God. And if you don't want to serve him now, if you don't want to be one of his people now, if you don't want to be his servant now, he's not going to force you to be that eternally in heaven with him. He's going to leave you to your own devices. Do you not remember the parable of the tares and the sower? Let me read that for you. Jesus spoke this parable in the Gospel of Matthew. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No. Least while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time of harvest, and at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. That's the parable. Now we don't have to wonder what this parable means because his disciples ask him and thankfully it's recorded for us. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let them hear. Notice, the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. They're the sons of the kingdom. Remember the verse that we read. Remember, when we started out 
early in the sermon, we read Peter. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from flesh, fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You are, if you are truly a child of God, if you are his chosen, if you are the good seed, you are his chosen people and you are called to be a pilgrim. And I submit that you are a pilgrim. So best to realize what you are. A good man knows what he is. I was reading earlier today the beginning of the Gospel of John. And John the Baptist part where he says, I must decrease. And they asked him, are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? And he said, no. He said, I have my voice crying out in the wilderness. He knew who he was. He knew his part. He knew what he was called to be. Even when it meant that he had to decrease. He understood his role. Likewise, you and I, let's understand our role. We are strangers and pilgrims on the earth, beloved. Do not get too comfortable here. This is a temporary dwelling. Your body is a tent. So Paul calls your body. It's a tent. It's a temporary thing. Your body is a tent. It is temporary. Again, the things of this earth are passing away. So let's live for something better. Let's be set apart from this world. As in the world, but not of the world. Are you familiar with the Feast of Tabernacles. It is one of the three mandatory feasts God tells his people to observe. And in that, part of that is dwelling in booths, dwelling in temporary dwellings for a period of time every year. And that's a good reminder and can be a very good reminder not to get too comfortable where you are. Because sooner or later you'll have to leave, wherever that is. Again, to paraphrase what is written. Whoever loves the world too much is an enemy of God. What would you give in exchange for your life? How much riches would you exchange to go to hell? How many? How much? I submit there is no amount What is written is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is impossible with men is possible with God. Not telling you not to have things, but I'm telling you to possess them and don't let them possess you. Luke chapter 14. You cannot be my disciple unless you love me more than you love your father and mother, your wife and children. And your brothers and sisters, you cannot follow me unless you love me more than you love your own life. Why? Because your life here is temporary. You are a pilgrim. Your life eternal is with Christ. And if you wouldn't leave everything for him, if you wouldn't leave everything behind for him, then I submit you're too comfortable and too attached to the things of this world. And that's what Jesus says here. You cannot follow me unless you love me more than you love your own life. Do you love? Jesus more. It's a tall order, I know. Do you love Jesus more than you love everything on this earth combined? Do you love him more than that? Are you ready? Are you willing to give up everything for Christ? With that, I want to say thanks for listening to Simple Man Sermons. As you'll know if you listened to the last sermon, my wife and I are on a bit of a pilgrimage. I stepped down from a full-time general manager position. It became clear that I couldn't do quality or quantity of preaching while doing that job. If you don't know, there are other podcasts, Gunfighter Life, for those men called to be warriors, to show them that there is a way to do that in a godly manner and also the Alpha Male podcast. If you're not familiar, that's a men's ministry. I like to call it a men's ministry in disguise.
men go there looking maybe for something else and they get something better. They learn how to be strong, dominant, alpha males, made in the image of God. Anyway, I stepped down from previous job, stepped out in faith by hopefully this podcasting will become more and better. If you want to be a part of that, if you want to support the ministry, goodshepherdtraining.com, consider becoming a patron. Again, that's goodshepherdtraining.com.